We're going to move on to content marketing now. This is a really interesting topic, particularly in the e-commerce world today. And um, we're very excited to have my good friend, and really a good friend to many, Bob Collins here from Fleischmann Hillard. Um, he's, he's the VP of digital and social media there. Um, and he's kind of a rock star in his own right, so we're pretty excited that he is here with this very illustrious and much admired panel of experts on content marketing. So take it away, Bob. Thank you very much. Do I have a, we do. How's everyone doing this morning? Fantastic, everyone ca caffeinated. I just want a quick shout out to uh, Dave, Carrie, De uh, Debbie, to the entire um, uh, MyTax community here. Thank you so for organizing this, this, in, this entire event. And um, I'm just, there we go. There's the volume. Okay. Well, it's really interesting when we're talking about content. It was interesting. It's never about the facts, and this. It's always about the story behind the facts. I just got in from Atlanta. It sounds, and it was 18. Uh, you could sit back and say it was 18 hours to get from what well, was 35 miles back to the airport. That does not tell the story. There is much more. It's like take every freaking you know 18-wheeler, put it on the highway with one other million people being released at the exact same time, put them on a Zamboni sheet of ice across the entire network outside of Uber uh, Atlanta, and then say, go have at it. It was amazing abandonment all over the place. But it was just like you sit back and you go, you can go to the facts and you say, it was under two inches of ice, of, of snow. It was not that cold. It shouldn't be that big a thing, but that does not tell the story. So it's really interesting when we're talking about content today. It's never about just the facts. It's about the story. It's about the experience behind the story. And, and it's interesting when you're looking at B2B and B2C, you know, like according to just about every marketing and business report out there, um, companies are increasing their spending on content creation. Uh, I think it was the Content Marketing Institute said that 90% of companies in the B2B uh, B2B, uh, B2C space are spending more in content, 91 in the B2B. Um, and then it's video, it's uh, photography, infographs, podcasts, you know, branded websites and so forth. And they're all trying to do the same uh, you know, kind of similar things, like to have the goals of to increase brand awareness, evangelize and engage customers, and yet drive net new leads and customer sales. But there are a few rare and amazing you know, brands out there that view content not just as a, a you know, means to an end, but they, uh, like, let's, where they look at it as a real strategic content narrative that become the actual foundation for their entire uh, the storytelling, for how they truly realize the brand experience. And you know, every single touch point that they have is part of a story. You know, it engages us in a unique and meaningful way. It stills a sense of belonging, wonder, interest, and excitement. Um, and it's these ongoing, like, authentic brand experiences that keep coming back. It's like real deliver, real business success, market growth, loyalty. And that's where commerce really is derived from. And that's why I'm excited to be um, in the conversations I've had over the past two weeks with this great group of people here, to because these are some of the, you know, the best storytellers and amazing brands and market leaders are actually helping deliver and create that new wave of content and brand experience across the board. So with that, I'd like to introduce our fantastic panel here. We have Brian uh, Michael uh, Bourne, brand strategist from Tumblr. Hello, everybody. Is this on? Yes? OK, great. Nice to be here today. Thank you. And Joanne Dominiconi. Dominiconi. Dominiconi um, uh, from our friends over at The Gromit. She is the co-founder and chief discovery officer. Love that title. And Robin Dominiconi from Rue La La. At first, it was, everyone was like, Bob, I think you got a mistake here. We got the same name back and forth, but so we got this. But with that, you know, thanks again for joining us. And I'd just like to kick it off. Um, actually, just tell us a little quick background. Um, just introduce yourselves quickly to the, uh, the group here today. Michael, you want to start? Yeah, sure. So um, I'm new to Tumblr. I've been working with them for approximately two months. Uh, prior to that, I was at the Mullen Agency for 200, 156 months. So I thought you were going to uh, say years. Yeah, I was going to say 256 <laughs> months, but that seemed wrong. Um, so 13 years at Agency Life and uh, two years uh, working for a social media you know, organization. And it's interesting just to sort of make that switch over to the other side from you know, promoting social on behalf of clients uh, and then actually working at, the agent, at, at a social media enterprise itself. So I'm really happy to be here today. Um, you know, I want to thank Debbie for having us all and for Google for giving us all sorts of free stuff, which is great, and food, yummy things like that. And, um, you know, hopefully, um, 
I can share some of my experience. As I've been working with Tumblr uh, at the agency since 2011, so with, with Mullen and with projects. But, um, you know, just a really interesting experience. And my job here, I'm actually Tumblr's first hire in the Northeast. So I'm brand strategist for the Northeast, which is kind of crazy. So I'm an office of one. Um, and you can find me anywhere. I'm born social on all different sites if you want to. Um, so feel free to tweet me and follow my Tumblr blog, of course. And uh, happy to answer questions. I meet with brands in New England and also agencies, of which uh, I'm just always just blown away by how much talent and creativity I'm seeing. So I'm really happy to be here with you today. Good to have Tumblr represented in Boston, so thanks. Thank you. Joanne. Yeah, Joanne Domeniconi uh, from The Gromit. We founded The Gromit in 2008, five years ago, as a product launch platform to tell the stories of independent product creators. And um, it's really purposeful and soulful work that I'm very proud to be associated with. Um, I spent uh, 20 years at Stride Right Keds in the footwear industry. I started in retail. Um, in their stores, actually selling shoes in the retail store, and worked my way through the organization over 20 years to head really up product hands -on development. Really hands-on experience, as they say. Yeah, roll up your sleeves. Uh, my sleeves are always rolled up, and um, that served me well. Um, and one of the things that you know we're working on at Gromit, um, you know, content has been right at the core of our business since day one. Uh, storytelling is a way to engage and promote product understanding. And that is the key challenge when it comes to selling products, creating that understanding. So I'm really excited to be here today and tell you a little bit more about our strategies and our learnings around that. And um, thank you for having me. Great. Robin. So um, my name is Robin Domeniconi, and I have been at Rue La La as the Chief Marketing Officer since September. Um, before that, my background has been basically in brand building um, many years ago. Um, started a brand called Real Simple. Um, um, from Real Simple, um, ran the brands at Time Inc. to figure out what the, brand, what the magazines were outside of the brand. The distribution channel of the magazine was how the magazine industry used to define itself and sometimes still does. And I always kept saying that it's not the distribution channel, it's the... It's the um, it's the, it's the what of the, of the brand. So if Real Simple is like how we help uh, people simplify their lives or make it easier, then we could do it in lots of different ways. And it's very important to understand that it's not, this is a magazine, and from the magazine we'll do this, but the magazine was just one of the distribution channels. So from there, I, um, I went into private equity for a while, looking at digital companies and helping them become brands. Went over to Microsoft um, for two years as the vice president of the U.S. for advertising, sales, and marketing, helping it have a media face, not just a technology face. Bottom line, it's a technology company. So I went to <laughs> L. <laughs> um, I became the chief brand officer of L, L Decor, and L Girl, which is overall content and business, figuring out what would be outside of the pages of that brand. Um, it was uh, all about trying to figure out, again, its extension five years from now. And um, from there, got into e-commerce, and I'm at Rue La La um, for four months now. And we will be, um, I'll tell you some of the stories that we're taking, where we're taking it, and um, how we're getting into more and more storytelling and content. Well, it's interesting. You were talking about, you know, it's not, it's a technology company. It's not this type of company. In many ways, content is just not content. It actually needs to be kind of a platform for engagement and telling a story. We're not creating you know, brand experiences to compete against our competition. We're creating brand experiences to, keep, to compete against pop culture to a certain degree. So I'd like to kind of open it up. One of the first questions here is, you know, why are brand experiences and you know, storytelling so important and even more so today? So let's just open it up and we'll go right back to Michael. All right. Um, so you came from a cold weather climate and had to travel 15 hours. I just got back from Costa Rica, so I have a wonderful tan and uh, I'm starting to peel. Um, so we'll move on to Robin. Yeah, no, no, no. Let, let, <laughs> I, this, this is actually relevant. Um, so I was telling Debbie that I was visiting my wife's family down there, and um, we were driving down to a lovely beach, a place called Haco Beach in Costa Rica. And on the way there, about every other probably 100 feet, there's a sign that says Taco Shack this way. All right? And after about seven miles of Taco Shack this way every 100 feet, I turned to my wife and I said, you know what? I feel like having tacos for lunch. And then, um, you know, we went, and it was delicious. And I was thinking, this is kind of interesting. And then after we left the beach, uh, we were driving, and I saw this uh, sign for a restaurant called Roasty Pollos. And it's a little bit like um, the Chicken Brothers, if you're fans of Breaking Bad. It's a Costa Rican thing, Pollos Hermanos. 
And um, I said to my wife, isn't that the place where your grandfather used to take you when you were a little kid because you love the black beans and it's so special and it has so much meaning to you? And she said, yes. And I said, well, your, father, your grandfather passed away you know, in November. I think we should go there. And we immediately went there and had an amazing time. And I was thinking, that's really the difference between advertising and social media marketing today, is that I turned to my wife and I had a compelling story. And maybe I just wanted really good chicken. But um, you know, I think that that had us going to that restaurant. And we had a great time. It was a sit-down place. It's not that the tacos were bad. I mean, they knew I wanted tacos. And they were hitting me up with tacos right when I needed it. And they were repeating the taco message as much as possible. So it, my brain said tacos when I got to the beach. But the fact that this emotional connection was made with a retailer through yep. a story, that really sold it for me. So. Or as uh, Don Draper back at Mad Men said, what we're selling here is not pictures. We're selling nostalgia. We're selling memories. Yeah, it was, the, working it was the feeling that I was able to connect between that restaurant and my wife's story that really made me eat there. So. Great. And I think and, and Tumblr has that platform. It allows everyone to do that. Yes, if you go to roastypoyos.tumblr. I'm not just kidding. <laughs> yeah. Great. And Robin? Uh, so it, that's interesting, the, the regards to um, basically just showing product tacos or um, telling the why of, of, of why you would want something. And when I was at Real Simple, we would say, okay, so um, we're going to talk about how to um, – you know, have this wonderful, easy way to clean your house. It sounds very boring. And, and if we put products in there and showed you all the products, uh, you would not have been engaged with the story. But what we did was showed you a really clean, sparkling kitchen or a really beautiful bed that was made with white sheets. We didn't show you just the white sheets. We told you the story in pictures. And today the story goes further with that because it goes in every single touch point. And you have to realize that when you're in these different touch points with content, that you are communicating the way that content should be delivered. It should not be the same. It may be the same message, but it's told completely different. You know, the, the you know, this is, have, how many of you have seen that uh, poster of the donut and tells you about social media? So a lot of you have seen that. I like donuts. I eat donuts. This is where I eat donuts. This you is have where, yeah. to understand that. You have to know that. That's the storytelling. That's the contextual part. I think we all understand that we need to make a story to connect with it. I mean, the Bible was our original storytelling. We all connect to storytelling. But you have to make sure also that where you're telling the story and where you're connecting with your uh, member, reader, buyer, whoever it may be, is, the, is contextual. Joanne? Well, the only thing that I could add to that is that today digital tools are allowing us to go do more than just make a simple connection. We can make we can make real human connections. At Gromit, we um, you know we uh, have embedded storytelling into the very fiber of our business. Um, and what we've seen is that the product creator becomes the hero, not. You know, you don't want to make your business the hero. You want to, yep. if you want to have a purposeful um, business and you want to really connect with consumers, contemporary consumers today, you need to have a hero. Um, and if you can make the hero the product or you can make the hero even better, a human person, uh, the product creator, uh, we're seeing amazing traction and connection. Well, you work with a lot of artisans, and you kind of create a platform for them, and you kind of like oh, tell your story we, we about you and why makers. you did that. Yes, yeah. we, make, we call them makers because there's people, a lot of people making things today. And um, what we've found is that people support, want to support these makers. They're the little guy. And when you're able to create a platform that tells their stories and connect act consumers and maybe even media or other retailers to this story, very powerful things happen. It's about power. And storytelling is it can be very, very powerful. And it's interesting. And then taking consideration today's theme for e-commerce, I'd like to turn it right back over to you. It's like, how does then storytelling, brand experience, and content actually drive commerce? So it uh, looks like you want to say something, Robin? Playing off of, is my thing on? It's on, right? Yeah. My microphone. Can everyone hear the team up here okay? Uh, playing off of what you just said, it's, um, you're so right. You're actually playing off what you said also with regards to, isn't that where your wife, isn't that where your dad took you? Um, and one of the things at Rue La La that we try to do is we try to make, you know, fashion and style, it's a really intimidating thing. 
And it's, it's not something that we should be told. It's something that we should feel. And I think that we all felt it when we were little kids. We felt like, you know, I, I know I fought with my mother. I wanted to wear my outfit out at three years old. And I felt really great and confident to wear what I wanted. And she said it looked ridiculous. Take it off. And we fought for hours. And then you grow up and it's like, well, why aren't you confident? And well, you told me not to wear this. Everyone told me I was wrong. Well, what we, we want to do with the storytelling and the content is to get you back to that original feeling mm -hmm. of when you walked out of the house in your cape and you went, or, or your Halloween costume way past Halloween and went to the playground and you felt confident. That's what we want you to feel. And so in the storytelling that we're evolving at Rue La La, it's about a place where you can come and you know to feel confident with that, whatever you put, up, put on because personal style is is the best style and where you're getting it we make you feel confident it's not about telling you it's about having you just become the hero um and hey, michael yeah I, I actually brought some visuals for my presentation today um which the other team yeah. have not so know, michael I, is at I, a disadvantage I totally so you can just totally use one picture I, I cheated i begged them i said listen tumblr is so highly visual can we show some visual content could you show nick the tjx version uh, not that one show um it's the TJX or tjmax.tumblr.com. Nope. Yes. So, uh, and I'm not just doing this because I know that uh, you know we're all having lunch uh, soon on TJ Max. Uh, but um, you know, this is a great example of a brand that's embracing uh, storytelling to sell its products. And I think that what they have managed to do is to highlight and spotlight a designer every month to talk about their collection and their personal style. And they're called Maxinistas. Uh, I think I'm having a Maxinista moment right here. Um, but, you know, just incredibly interesting content that's curated by other people, right? I think the biggest challenge for a lot of brand marketers today when they're thinking about how can we be creative is how can we actually showcase our personality effectively? And how can we make it relevant for each and every platform that we're on? And obviously Tumblr is one of, you know, hundreds that you could be on. So how do you manage to be uh, appropriate within each and every channel that you're going to be marketing on? So it's not just you know, one message for multiple platforms. It's multiple message for multiple platforms from multiple people. Um, and it gets uh, challenging. But I really wanted to show this as an example. Another one, just real quickly, isn't uh, in particular a retailer. But if you put up the, um, uh, the one that's for the, hung the Hunger Games, capitalcouture.pn, if you have that. Yeah, this is. Um, uh, so Katniss Everdeen, um, uh, Glo Golden Globe winner that she is, um, you know, and this is a site where if you're on it, it, you would never know what this is. This is actually something that's more from your world um, in terms of real simple and fashion, but it's an entire magazine for a virtual world that doesn't exist, the world of Panem from the Hunger Games. So it's capitalcouture.pn, and all that is on this site are all the different fashions from the movies uh, and also work that's been done by artists and designers, and it's spotlighted on a Tumblr. You wouldn't even know this is a Tumblr, except that it's just running on the back end as a Tumblr, but the content tells the story of all the outfits that everyone loves from the, the movies, and it gets you psyched about that. So, you know, people love to see all the crazy fashion from the movies, and they've decided to create this as though it was a real reality. Um, so, you know, you can really play a lot with your presence on social media and be different and be a fantasy and make it real uh, for the reader uh, and the consumer. So I'm just always blown away by the storytelling that can you, happen. You can also partner. I, I, this is very interesting. What, what you see here, we've done this where we partnered with um, Lifetime when they were doing Bonnie and Clyde. And we did a whole how to look, the look of Bonnie and Clyde. And we did storytelling behind Bonnie and Clyde. So there's <laughs> ways also to bring in your partners to do storytelling where it's a great business opportunity. Well, I yeah. think it's, it's something you mentioned here with, with the Bonnie and Clyde, and we, we spoke about briefly the other day, um, is that when you have this brand experience and storytelling and you're tying it into commerce, keep it tied to that brand experience when they are going through that commerce experience. So it's not like all of a sudden, great, I want that product, and then you turn into this nightmare Excel spreadsheet buying system that doesn't work. It needs to kind of tie into that whole yeah, brand. Are you guys, uh, ladies probably more than men, uh, fans of Sephora? Because my wife loves Sephora uh, for some reason, always runs to them in the mall. If you, if you can show the glossy. So this, this is their... This is your last slide, Michael. No, no yeah, fair. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I just thought it was fun. I actually, I, know. I have the Rue La La Tumblr as well that I could show everybody. Oh, go um, to that right now. Yeah, let's go to that right now. <laughs> uh, but anyway, this is just an interesting example well of, of a brand that, this is their Tumblr, but if you went uh, to their homepage and clicked over to that, it looks exactly the same. There's no d difference between 
what is on here as, as sort of showing trends, because this is the trends section of their home site, just happens to be powered by Tumblr, and what is actually on their home page. So I think that's an interesting message for retailers in terms of keeping them closer through the social as opposed to making them work for it, right? Because you know, if I have to get to your retail uh, by clicking through a Facebook tab and then get out of Facebook, um, I'm not as happy a camper as I may be if I was doing it right there in the platform. So I think that's, that's an interesting message for brands today. And uh, you know, this is something that Target um, has also done very, very well. Uh, they have a Tumblr. Um, Nick, I won't make you pull that slide up. I'm sorry uh, for having visuals. But um, that's also a good example of a brand that allows you to get straight to the checkout box right from your social sharing, right? So that's, isn't that the social media goal that we're all kind of hoping for for clients is that they will immediately see this story, love this story, fall in love with it so much that they want to embrace it and sort of make it their own and, and buy the product. And I think, um, you know, how you do that, you know, not hard selling, but more so focused on relationship building. That's another thing that I think is very important for brands today. Yeah. Joanne, do you have anything to add with regards to content and commerce? I'd like to add is, you know, how you do it. You know, how do you do your storytelling? And I, I would say that, you know, kind of stay true to yourself, kind of find your own voice. And it doesn't need to be expensive or overly produced. If you take a look at our videos, they're engaging and entertaining. Sometimes they're funny, but they're not expensively produced. It's m almost for us, and this isn't for every brand, but it's more real um, if there's kind of funky little mistakes or people can connect to that um, these days. Now, some brands would require, you know, highly produced um, content, um, but that's not, you know, it's not required. Um, when you create content, stay true to yourself and um, be distinctive, I think, and, and make sure that you have people in charge of it that are good storytellers. Um, I, and I'll, 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 I'll use an example. Um, if anybody watched the um, State of the Union address, this is not business, but I think it was something that everybody could connect to, can connect to. You know, President Obama, and I'll say I'm a, fa I'm a fan, he went through, you know, almost an hour of his talk talking about himself and the things that his administration had accomplished. But he connected with people when he told the story of the hero. And the entire place was on their feet clapping for for minutes, maybe more than just a few minutes. And he did a good job. He ended really, really strongly, whether you like him or not. Um, and then if you, you looked at the Republican response, it was rehearsed. And it was uh, difficult to, to, to listen to. Um, the story was good, but the delivery was, was um, strained. And, and so I will say that you know, kind of be true to yourself. Be yourself as a brand. Know, know who you are as a brand, and then translate that into your content and your storytelling. Because that's, if you're not yourself and you're not real, forget it. Yeah. That, that goes back to, um, and a lot of people forget this, and we talked about this on the phone, um, to the why. Like, we all kind of know what we do. We all know how we do it. And there's this um, speaker, Simon Sinek, that always talks about the why you do something. Why do people come to you? And I think the best example of this is the Chipotle. Have you guys seen the Chipotle ads where um, the, scare, the scarecrow? The scarecrow, but also the, the farmers who went yep. through all the agriculture. Yeah. That's storytelling. Like you, you understand what they stand for. A, a really easy one to understand is the Dove campaigns, the inner beauty. Mm -hmm. Dove is a soap. You know, you think, well, Dove is a product. How am I going to? The why is that you tap into your inner beauty. Once you know what your why is of your brand, the storytelling becomes so much easier. The why is not what you do. We are a, a flash sale site that offers great brands at discounted prices. How we do it is we go up at 11 o'clock and it's urgency. But that's not our why. You have to figure out what your why is in order to do your storytelling. Our why is to tap into that inner here, that, that, that girl with the, with the tutu the, or that I wanted to wear out that my mom told me not to. That confidence of personal style. Figure out what your why is and the storytelling becomes much easier, like the Dove or the Chipotle. And nine out of ten times, they're very primal, they're very humanistic, yeah, they're very cross, you know, cross-generational right. mm -hmm. across the board. My, mm -hmm. my why right now is if you go to the flatteringman.com, this is um, something that Old Spice has produced. 
Any guys here? Oh, uh, yes, this yeah. is a great why. Great ch ch now. Check out the flatteringman.com because, you know, I think they're much like Red Bull kind of, you know, pioneering interesting things. And I saw this and my immediate action was to send it to five of my guy friends and tag them all on Facebook and say, hey, I think you should do this. Um, but basically, I won't give it away because I don't want to ruin the surprise, but you should all try that site. But, you know, in terms of, you know, should the content be highly produced or should it not be highly produced for visual, um, there was the Adobe study recently that said something to the effect, and I wrote it down, 650% higher engagement rate on Facebook for visual posts rather than just text posts, mm -hmm. which I think says a lot. And I know that um, on the Tumblr platform, something like 80%, north of 80% of the posts are all visuals. And also the number one action of all people who see content on Tumblr is to share it. So it's 95% of the posts that are on Tumblr, and you're talking about 80 million posts a day, uh, are to just reshare other visual content. Mm -hmm. So you know when you think of a story, sometimes brands are like, geez, it's so hard to come up with something interesting. Um, and they'll work with agencies to develop that brand you know, method and come up with calendars. Um, you know, the, the biggest thing for all of us, like the holy grail of any of this, is the real-time thing, right? Trying to figure out how can we be super current right away. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't tell Nick to post it, so I'm not going to have him go to it, but there's the Denny's Diner Tumblr. I don't know if you guys are familiar with it, but um, you wouldn't even know it's a Tumblr. It's just Denny's Diner, I think, .com. And uh, at CES, you all, you all know about Michael Bay and his huge implosion and this huge snafu. The monitor yeah, does the, not yeah, work. He, I'm out of here. He basically lost it because he was trying to read off a teleprompter and the teleprompter didn't work. So he threw a hissy fit and ran off the stage. So the next day, Denny's had a post about this <laughs> and had copy written on Michael Bay's teleprompter as an animated GIF. And it said, I can't stand you know, the, you know, this anymore. I have to go to Denny's right now. I'm leaving. <laughs> And so I just thought that was really clever that they put two and two together because they knew everyone was talking about hashtag Michael Bay CES 2014. The only thing I would say with that is be cognizant of actually what is your brand strategy that it works. You have a yeah. brand narrative that it plays within that because always reacting to a meme but it doesn't support you is yeah. just you're, you're, you're spending a lot of time and energy that yeah. doesn't help. It's not help for everybody, but a great, Denny's a, can do it. A great one was Oreo during the Super Bowl last year when the lights went out. It's all about real time. Or how about the Grammys with Arby's, uh, the hat, the um, uh, Pharrell, yeah, Pharrell Williams, and his hat looked like an Arby's. You jump on that, and you can, you can make it sometimes work for you. But if it doesn't, you will get nailed. Exactly. I mean nailed. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think the one thing that Oreos did is they carried that through the entire year. They did the um, every, I think, week in the newspaper in the corner column, they had a different Oreo for a pop culture event that was going on. And it was all yeah. about establishing. I like, I like the Mars rover going over the The Mars cookie. rover going over, or the gay pride parade. Yep. I mean, that was a big stance. So I just think, like, in your mind, it, you might relate to them more than a Nabisco. If you're going to get a chocolate chip cookie, you, you, you relate to that. Yeah. It's all about being a current brand, and it's really hard. Like, Coke is happiness, all right? So Coca-Cola started doing these bottles where they split them in half, and they'd offer, you could give one bottle or buy a Coke for someone in Afghanistan or whatever. So it, <clears throat> it is hard when you're a commodity, but to relate into an emotional real-time connection that is not going to nail you. Because you can get nailed. There was a lot of people doing things on Memorial Day that they should not have been doing. <laughs> yeah, but I think it comes down to your point earlier about being more human, right? And trying to connect with people as individuals right. as opposed to thinking you're a big, faceless, nameless brand. I think as an individual, we're all sharing interesting current events with our friends on all social networks. So for a brand to get down to that level, to have it be as real time as possible, mm -hmm. just makes the brand more human. And it does, that, associate, that's a perfect yeah, point, and it does yeah. associate something with the Oreo saying, I am going to do this with uh, uh, marriage equality and human right. rights. Right. Um, I'm not Chick-fil-A who's going to do this. It that's showcases right. who you are as a brand and what you want to be recognized and associated with. And I, think, I don't think Joanne? you look at these touch points you know, from an ROI standpoint. You know, you're connecting and maybe just putting a smile on somebody's face, but those po that positive connection will pay off over time. And, and you can't, you know, today, if you're 
if you're connecting with people, you can't think of it as like I'm monitoring the social media, I'm monitoring the platforms. You really need to, you, you need as a brand to really be engaging and connecting. And it's not pushing information about your product. It's about making people smile. It's about connecting with them on all different types of subjects and differently on each platform. Well, you know, yeah, and I think that, that goes very well to the one part we had a great conversation about and we spoke about it the other day is making sure we, you can't, we can't be talking about content and commerce without talking about the evolution and pervasiveness of today's mobile culture. Um, people are saying that 60 to 80% of all major buying decisions are starting in a mobile format before they get to a laptop or something of that nature. Yes. Um, and a lot of them are actually starting there and ending there, depending upon what's the nature of the, the real-time engagement of the product or the good or the service. But So the question I have is, how is that evolution pervasiveness? How, how are you as a company adjusting your content and commerce stra strategy based upon you know, our mobile phones are not low, no more than three feet away from us usually at most times. So let's, Michael. Okay. Um, so yeah, basically one out of every two visitors to Tumblr right now is coming to Tumblr through their mobile device. So that's significant. And um, there's been a 251% increase in engagement on mobile uh, over the past year, I think is what it is. So, you know, it's a, definitely a big place for, for Tumblr for sure. And for any brand that has to, you know, happens to be on social media, definitely. I think, you know, I th when Mark Zuckerberg was asked about Facebook, he said he wished he'd started it back when, you know, smartphones were as prevalent as they are today. And I think it's, you know, 56% of Americans have smartphones, 96% of them have cell phones. So we're all there. You know, we're all, you're probably all hashtagging this right now. Um, so I think it's sort of interesting. I mean, we're, we're at Google, Google today, and Google, you know, mobily, um, you know they want to own maps and and that's that query for where is this you know 20 percent i think of the desktop searches uh, for google are where is such and such this thing and i think they own 70 percent of any sort of where where based queries it's pretty ridiculous and they've uh, actually mapped six million miles of the earth's roads uh, which i think is 12 trips there and back to the moon so you know why are they doing this? They're doing this because they know that search is going to become extremely local and that it's going to become very relevant to you where you are. So, um, you know, the fact that we're all, you know, looking to, you know, impact purchases at the point of sale out in yep. actual real places, bricks and mortars, as well as do it online, I think impacts your location as well. So I think that's what makes really mobile the most interesting is the whole geolocal thing. Joanne, with Gromit, what are you seeing with uh, so mobile and engagement? Yeah. Um, I would say that um, we're behind on mobile. Um, honestly, we're very strong in content and um, behind. It's a big uh, initiative for us in 2014. Um, in 2013, we replatformed and we uh, created a responsive site. We don't have an app. And our question is today, will you know, resp a, a responsive site you know, serve us in 2014 and beyond. Um, we're getting engagement, but it's the transaction is difficult. It's more than two clicks, and that's a problem. So amazing. Yeah, I mean, come on, we've got to get it. We've got to get that going. So um, exciting things to be thinking about. Uh, you listen to the uh, discussions in this room, and you think I'm um, bringing uh, some important information back to the office about. Um, you know, where we need to be. Absolutely. And Robin? <laughs> so for us, um, our strategy has evolved to actually mobile first. Um, I'd say over the holidays, probably uh, well over 70%, uh, 60%, about 70% were coming to us through mobile and over 40% of our revenue right now, not just during holiday, but overall is coming through mobile. And that's a huge, um, huge opportunity. We, we have to catch ourselves all the time because we'll be in the room, you know, what is the site going to look like? What is the sale going to look like? What are we going to do with these models? And half the time we design it in the past, we went, wait, that copy's not going to come out on the mobile. And so the experience, our business naturally is built off of urgency. At 11 o'clock, if you're not there to get those, you know, Todd shoes that are going to be up, they'll be sold out. And it's not fair if you're at, you know, you're, not at your desk. So for us to make the member experience as good as possible, we are mobile first. And um, everything we do right now starts with mobile and then it works um, backwards. 
And um, it is a very, very important platform as we move forward. And you're 100% right with the, you cannot have them click, 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 click. They got to see what they like, one click, buy it. We're all trying to get to that Amazon just uh, that metal, emotional metal. Im impulse and just... Yeah, it, well, that's, well, we're based off urgency and impulse, Absolutely, yes. great. Um, we have just a few more moments left, and I just want to ask the panel just one quick question and then kind of just get your thoughts on this quickly, and then two questions out to the audience is, how does social play into your content strategy? It's everything. <laughs> Done. All right, now. <laughs> uh, no, I mean, I think this is, uh, this is about e-commerce today. That's why we're here, right? right? So you're really interested in understanding how this stuff works from a, a click-to-buy perspective. Um, you know, Tumblr, and I'm not just saying this because I work for the company, but, you know, of all the different social platforms, this has the highest number of minutes spent on the platform. So it's north of 16 minutes per session visit that people are spending looking at the dashboard on Tumblr, which is kind of ridiculous. And, you know, the metric that I think is most important right now to look at for a brand is the amount of engagement that you're having with the consumers that are looking at your content. Because it's not site visits? Well, sites visits are very important, but I think we're look, moving toward a place with native advertising where it's really coming about sort of can we get cost per action to happen? So not just looking at this, but can we go from that native ad and then look at can we click through it and do we then wind, wind up buying? This Monday, they, I'm just going to talk really quickly, there's an Adobe Digital Index Q4 2013 social intelligence report. That's a mouthful. Um, He's got these stats th later yeah, on. Yeah, I wrote, I wrote them down. Them, so. Tumblr exhibited the largest increase in year-over-year -year revenue per visit on referrals to retail sites of 304% growth, which is ridiculous. And um, people are spending a, a dollar ten when they leave Tumblr to go to a retail site, and that's only second to Facebook, where they spend a dollar twenty-two coming from Facebook and going into a retail site. So the question of you know does social media impact ROI? for retailers, I, I think it's not even a question to be asking anymore, really. It's sort of, yes, it does, and how can we, you know, economize and efficient, make these things more efficient so, uh, you know, instead of buying that taco on the side of the road, I'll go and buy that chicken instead. There you go. Joanne, social, um, from it. So, you know, I think a brand lives you, it, you, a brand permeates all the platforms. Um, an interesting story this week, we got a beautiful letter from a guy that wrote, uh, his name is Ed Moss, he's a, he's a farmer from the Midwest, and he said, the people, the people, your platform, your stories, everything about you inspires me, and guess what? You stood up to my scrutiny because I checked you out on Facebook and I read your blog and I, I looked um, at your message board, and guess what? You're the real deal. Let me tell you something, in a nanosecond we were back to him, my partner Jules and I, because guess what? This is the power of content because people have the power to research you and know yep. you deeply by your footprint across all of these platforms. So take it seriously. Leave a, a track of who you are and people will trust you. Trust is the biggest thing in a business. Yeah. Believe me, there's no doubt about it. And, it, and uh, these platforms let you show who you are in a very transparent way. Don't ever hide anything. No, and people either. are making purchases based upon their own values, and they're looking at those right. other elements around before they do. That's right. And Robin. So I think most was covered, but I'll give one one tip I once um, a, lo a while back had heard, and well, way back, and have always taken it forward is um, look at social as if. Um, you're dating someone, and on the very first date, if you sit there and you talk to the someone and just talk to them and talk to them and tell them all about you and all about you and all about you, you're not getting a second date. And the second date, if, if, you, talked about some, if you talked about yourself and then they talked about themselves and you got to know each other, the next thing is, wow, what are your interests? So that we could talk about interests or do interests together. But you have to build that relationship, and if you just start talking socially, this is who we are, this is what we do, and you don't listen, or engage and then talk about interests, you'll never have that connection. So make sure you understand the content in social. Fantastic. Do we have time for a quick question before the rest of them come out? Or do we want to have, okay, great. And two quick questions. Anyone from the audience here today? Yes. The, the the question was editorial sensibility and analytics with regards to how you? Sure. 
the balance of the two and shaping those stories. It's everything. Uh, well, I would say there's an art and a science to everything, but we do use the science. For instance, there was, um, even in the content of which models we use, there was a model I really just did not like. I was like, let's, let's take her off site. But when I went and I looked at the data, our members loved her. And so when I know what they're engaged with, when I know or we know, and we look to see where they're clicking, what they're buying, what they're engaging with in the content, then we do more of that and we do less of something else. But we absolutely take the, we have analytics and, and my, my analytics technology person's right here. Uh, we, we make sure we measure everything and we're not just doing it because we think it looks good, but we're doing it to offer value. So we know that, that in order to celebrate your personal style, you wanna know, show me with what, show me how, show me why not, show me what's new. So we make sure we're tapping on the four areas that we know our members want. Fantastic, great question. Last questions, anyone? Fantastic. No, thank you very much. I'd like to uh, thank our great panel up here. Michael, Joanne, and Robin. Uh, my name is Robert Collins. Thanks again for your time. We'll, uh, we'll be around later on today.